Good evening. Good evening. I would like to call this, this meeting of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Advisory Committee to order. I would also like to thank our viewing audience for tuning in tonight. I would like to ask Evangelist Owens for our invocation at this time. That would be if you will. Well, Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for your son, Jesus, uh, your grace and your mercy, and you continuing to love on us in spite of us. Now, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to go before us as we meet and discuss um, important matters. We pray, Lord, that you will intervene, Lord, and give us the best solutions um, to help uh, aid in building a, a better community for your people. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Jesus, and we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, we would like to um, welcome and introduce the members of, uh, and the staff and all the other visitors also. Yeah. I'm Isaiah Owens, uh, uh, the evangelist at the Bill Fork Road Church of Christ um, here in Jacksonville, I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, I came here three years ago um, to serve this city uh, in, in ministry. Um, so uh, that's me. Thank you. Steve Forney, uh, my wife and I uh, were sent here in 1987, and we have never left. Okay. have totally enjoyed it. Thank you, Steve. Sorry. I'm Jerry March. I own and operate a travel agency by the name of Dream Vacations, and uh, we've lived here just around five years now. Okay, thank you. Carmela George, I'm a businesswoman here in Jacksonville, uh, born, raised on a playground is where I spent most of my days, and um, <laughs> I love Jacksonville. I've been here since 1982, and I've been on every board just about. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your service. I'll say that now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Marsha Wright, I think I'm, no, I'm certainly not a charter member, but I've been with this group <laughs> since 1987 and uh, came here uh, with my husband, who was in the military from Ohio, and have uh, came for four years, and we're still here, so. Thank you. Paula Jones, and I've been with this group Oh, as long as, as uh, Marcia. Um, and I've been living in Jacksonville since I was six years old. I won't tell you how old I just turned, but um, it's close to six. So, um, um, and neighborhood improvement is close to my heart. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now I got a special for him. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am Tracy Jackson. I'm director of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department and happy to see all of you all here. Good evening. I'm Pamela Trafton, Neighborhood Improvement Services Coordinator. Brian Jackson, Council Liaison, City of Jacksonville. Proud to say a son of a Marine. Proud to say I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. Um, I'm from, I say I'm from, from Jacksonville because my mother is actually from Jacksonville. So glad to be here. Um, yes, ma'am, we have one guest. Oh. Good evening, I'm Deanna Trouble and I'm with the Jacksonville NPO. I'm a city employee. Thank you, everyone, um, for introducing yourselves. On October 19th, the city council approved the appointment of Mr. Jonathan Paez yes, um, to the leadership development position on the committee. I would like to take this time to allow Mr. Jonathan to introduce himself um, to all of ourselves at this time. Hello, everybody on this committee. My name is Jonathan Paez. I've been in, living in Jacksonville eight years. I moved out here from Puerto Rico, and to put it shortly, for a better future for me and my family. I have a wife and a daughter, and I've seen, I live in, I live in Town Center, so I've been going through what's happening um, with all the other tenants, and in doing so, I um, tried to take a little bit of responsibility and speak on behalf of my uh, neighborhood and inform, inform the council of what was going on from our point of view. Uh, this, um, this position on the council was uh, advised to me by uh, Mr. Brian Jackson. And he said that um, it would be a great place to hear ideas and, and contribute ideas to better help the community. And uh, being a family man, 
I understand that having a good and healthy and strong community helps everybody mm -hmm. and it brings everybody forward and pulls everybody forward. So if I can make the world around me better, I can make the world for my family better. So in short, that's what I'm trying to do here. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, at this time, we'll get to the business of tonight. Has everyone had the opportunity to review the agenda? Changes or additions to the agenda? Is there a motion? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. The motion is carried. The minutes of uh, the August the 23rd, 2021 meeting are provided for consideration. Uh, members should review them, the minutes and um, note any corrections. Do I have a, a motion to adopt or amend the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll sign those minutes um, after this meeting. At this time, we have a transportation update. Ms. Deanna Treble. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> well, good evening, um, and again, thank you for having me this evening. Um, tonight, I would like to talk about a little, about a few projects that we're working on. Um, and at any time, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to interject and ask questions because I would really would like to give you as much information as possible. There we go. So, so we're working on some active projects right now within our community and our, the projects that we're working on are primarily within the, the Jacksonville corporate area. And that's only until recently since our planning area boundary has been expanded, which now means we're allowed to bring all these improvements that we've been very successful in bringing to Jacksonville to Onslow County as a whole. As you are traveling US 17, heading towards Wilmington, you might have noticed that there is a new signal going up at the Douglas Gate. Um, and that was a, as a result of both the Air Station and NCDOT and the city of Jacksonville working together to make that intersection a much safer one. Up until this project, um, we had traffic that was actually um, um, staging or parked on US 17 and as you can imagine when you're rush hour traffic of just a horrible situation that would that entails and so out of the box thinking that the base decided to get with NCDOT and gave them money to make the project move forward so that signal should be coming online I think it was this week I mean it's in the, in the throes of finishing up that that construction project but that intersection improvement is only meant to be an interim solution. The long-term solution is something that you've seen in that on the screen. We're looking at the long-term solution is going to be some type of an interchange. So the interchange we're looking at either at Onslow Pines or Morrill Hill Road or some other road in that vicinity. The intent is to construct the interchange that allows that staging or that congestion of, of those cars not to be on 17, but to take them onto that interchange and to allow a new base access road that has that queuing capability on their property. So right now, um, the city and working with the base and NCDOT, we actually received a grant from what used to be called um, Economic Development Commission with the, with the federal government. Um, we were successful in getting a $100,000 grant that 90,000 of it is paid by grant funds and that residual $10,000 will be through an in-kind match of staff time with our DOT partners in Onslow County. So this project is the intent is to conduct what's called a feasibility study. Um, and once we conduct the feasibility study, it identifies some alternatives such as the two that you have here, but it takes it a little bit more than just the pretty kind of the line on the, on the piece of paper. They're gonna look at um, 
the future, like existing conditions, future conditions, environmental concerns, et cetera. So we're about, we're gonna kick this project off here in the next month or so and with the long-term solution of having a feasibility study in, in hand so that we can compete for this project once DOT opens up the what's called the prioritization process. That's how we can submit projects for future funding. Um, so this is just one project that we're working on. You guys might have heard in the last couple of months about the Jacksonville Parkway extension. The DOT sent out some information about this project, but the concept is, is to extend that parkway where it currently ends at Western. And as you can see from the dotted line, we want it to go from where it ends now on Western to connect to Ramsey as the first phase. The second phase would pick up the improvements on Ramsey, either on existing Ramsey Road or on what we call new alignment, which means a new road. So this actually helps us what our long-term vision of creating an outer loop for Jacksonville. What we want is we want the ability to go from 17 to the airport without having to go through Western Boulevard or the bypass. And so a long range plan is, is that we're building this in sections that the intent would be from, you can get on the parkway, you can get to Ramsey, and then from Ramsey over to uh, what we call the 111 extension project. While that's not funded at this time, that is a project that we are currently working with NCDOT, but it would allow us that uh, direct access rather than having to go around Jacksonville the long way, this will be a more direct route. Uh, before you go to the next uh, thing, I have a question. It, um, it says from Jacksonville Parkway, then it has the commons in Western. Now, where is that at? on the inside of the public's um, new. So if you're if you're at um, the parkway now and you're at the stoplight, mm -hmm. Publix would be on your left. Okay. So just imagine there's a new road that you would just go straight. So, so it wouldn't a, be North. Be, so it wouldn't be North Commons Parkway. It would kind of just. Yeah. We, so it would be. Um, there's here. Let me get to the next slide. Okay. So there's a couple of different concepts that that NCDOT is looking at. So anytime NCDOT does a project, they, ha they, they always have to put forward more than one alternative. So this is the, the diagram that was sent out to the public of these are the various options. So the option that I would say that we ended up with is a, it's kind of a pink, okay, I dark see green, right brown area. But the concept is, is where you see the circle now with the pink route, that's where Jacksonville Parkway ends. Um, and with this project, we're actually asking for an extension of the Henderson Drive extension extension project um, because we need to we need to offer relief um, at, at both intersections, and this would allow a, a larger um, interchange or, or, or intersection where the where Henderson Drive extension extension would meet and the new Jacksonville Parkway would meet where they intersect. That would allow for a greater footprint for an intersection. And then you can see the, the pink route kind of takes it to Drummer Kellum, but in reality it's what they're looking at is either the blue route or the pink route combination. So this project actually just went through what's called merger, and that's where they go through the environmental and they look at um, the purpose and need statement. So th this project is moving forward, but it's changed just a little bit from these alternatives. But you can see that Publix is um, kind of left of the Henderson Drive extension extension. No, it's, in, it's between the two. If I may ask a question, is the only existing road on there, Ramsey Road, or all the other ones in color, the proposals? Yes, the one, so Ramsey's existing, and so all the other ones that go from in yellow, the yellow is is 17 and Western, that's existing. The other two are just concepts. They're just lines drawn to kind of show different areas. The reason why you've got the difference between the green and the blue is uh, the, um, the, the green and the blue lines. In the background, you can see that green, that's a conservation area. And so whenever they're looking at projects, that is- They that try to stay a, away from Yeah, that. they try to stay away with that, away from that because it, um, the environmental people don't like it when <laughs> we go in those areas. So again, these are just this is just one project that we're working on. 
Um, it's just slow going. Most projects, you know, take quite a while to go from concept to design and then construction. Another project that we're, in, that we're working on right now is what we're calling the Marine Boulevard Potential Road Diet. So specifically at the intersection of Georgetown and 17, I'm sure we've all been there, you get in your car and you're driving and, you're, and you realize how tight those lanes are. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have a considerable number of accidents between what's called mirror slaps. So the bigger, the bigger vehicles, their mirrors slap causing accidents. And so we have the opportunity potentially to, what, to do what we call a road diet, which means we're not moving the existing width of the entire road section is not going to change. But we're looking at possibility of maybe changing the lane configurations. So right now we've got, um, it's in, in most places, it's seven lanes. So we've got three lanes going one way, three lanes going the other way, and we have a center turn lane. Well, DOT will be resurfacing this road in the next year or so. So what we're looking at is, is it possible to potentially make some, uh, some um, changes in the road configurations and maybe instead of having three lanes and three lanes, maybe we have three lanes and two lanes. I don't know. That's why we're going to hire a consultant. The other big thing that I would like for the consultant to look at, we've all been there. We're heading out of town, heading on Richlands Highway, and everyone's jockeying for that one lane that goes straight. So at 5 o'clock, the traffic is really backed up. And so I would like the consultant to look at, can we make that two lanes? That makes more sense to me. It's safer. So we have two lanes going out to Richlands Highway. We have one lane that goes, you know, both, and then we've got one lane that's going on 17. So this is something we've just hired, or we're in the process of hiring a consultant, so we're hoping that we'll get some re um, answers here in the next um, maybe two months. So if it's possible, then we're going to work with NCDOT to see if we can make that happen when they go to resurface it. So this would be a super easy, inexpensive project for us and it would increase safety. So fingers crossed that it works in our favor. If not, not to worry, we have a longer term solution or potential project of just widening the road. Obviously, we've been out there. It's heavily developed, not ideal. Um, it would cost probably a lot of money for a right of way, et cetera. So this was a much better alternative than that longer term project of increasing the right of way. Another project we're pretty excited about is Jacksonville Station. Um, if you've driven on 17, the corner of East Thompson and Marine Boulevard, the Jacksonville Station is a new multimodal facility. And that just means that all modes of transportation will be able to pulse out of this one station. Um, and so it is a 15,000 square foot building. It's actually two buildings. Um, we've got, um, let's see, we've got the main entrance off of Thompson Street. We have a second entrance directly on Marine Boulevard. And then we have the, the bus platform where everyone, the buses will pulse in the background. And then we've got public parking for anyone who wants to come visit. So as I said, there, it's actually two buildings. The left side is operations and the right side is administration. So all of the, the pe when people come to ride the bus or have questions about Greyhound or Amtrak, you will go into the operations building and we have a ticketing area that will welcome you, answer questions, we'll be selling tickets. And on the administration side, that's where the people behind the scenes, um, people like me, I'll be on that side of the building. Um, but the day-to-day -day operations is going to be on the green side or the left side of the building. When we designed Jacksonville Station, we wanted it to have that old-time bus feel you know, back in the 40s, 50s, but with a new spin because it's brand new. So you can see that we've got an, an, um, some wainscoting, which are the lines. Um, I'm just kind of hard to see, I guess. I'm sorry about that. Um, the wainscoting will come up. We've changed it a little bit, but it's more about, um, about a five feet high wainscoting. Um, and we, we spent a lot of time looking at design elements such as the gooseneck lighting. And the gooseneck are the ones that kind of turn like this. Right, gooseneck. Um, so we've got, it's a beautiful, um, so, and I've got some pictures, beautiful red oak area um, that's going to be stained. We'll have vending machines. We also have a hospitality area for our military. 
Um, so right now, Greyhound does, they come and visit Jacksonville twice a day. When we started talking about what do we want for this station, Jacksonville is a caring community. And right now, when the Marines come on the Greyhound bus, they are they arrive to across the street here from city hall and it's a stop at a convenience store and we said we've got to do better and so we were very intentional in coming up with the space to make it warm and feet in that home feeling that this is welcome to your home for the next you know four years so we took some um, design elements from the airport when they did their their update so we now have, when Greyhound comes and drops off 50 to 60 Marines, we have a hospitality area for them, specifically for them, that we're going to be catering to their needs. And also in the restroom area, you know, they arrive in civvies or civilian clothes, and they have to turn out in their uniform. Well, we now have the, a dedicated space for them to make that happen. So we have in the restrooms, both in the male and female, we have what's called a change-out area. And the change out area allows them to get their civvies or their uniform out. We're going to provide irons if they need them to iron them and for them to get ready and wait in a comfortable area at the station for when the, the, they get picked up from the Marine Corps. So I, I just took some of these pictures this morning. So this is Jacksonville Station. When we were doing the design, we pulled some design elements from existing city buildings. So you can see we have another tower with a clock. You can see the, the very far building is the operations. The building closer to you on the screen is the administration building. Um, we have the design elements of the red brick, which is um, what you've seen on City Hall and Fire Station 2. Um, so this is Jacksonville Station. Here's a, um, the breezeway where you can, the, there's going to be a, um, an Uber and taxi kiss and ride drop off area where you can get out of the car and you can go straight back to the bus, bus platform to get on the bus or you can go into the building to get tickets or just wait for your bus. This is just another outside picture. This is um, out by the bus platform. They're installing concrete. So this is the bus platform, and it's got um, eight staging areas, four on each side. The smaller um, platform that you see there is actually for Greyhound or Amtrak. So we did the same thing that we did for our buses, but on a larger scale for those larger buses. So when you get off the bus from Greyhound, it, you're still in a covered area, and you can go directly into the operations side to wait. So here's the wainscoting that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is what the, the ticketing or waiting area. Um, the, it's actually red oak that is being installed, very high quality um, a wood. We're very impressed with it. And it actually looks really good this way, but we're gonna be staining it. Um, and we'll have polished concrete floor. And you can see t kind of some design elements. There's a skylight at the top and um, there'll be some acoustical um, ceiling that will go on in the on the um, ceiling area to kind of um, break down some of the, the uh, sound in that room since it's going to be polished concrete floors. Here's the, the bathrooms where I was mentioning that here's the, the bathroom area with the wainscoting and then we have um, here's the turnout area where they'll be able to make the make changes so they're still finishing all of this. So we're super proud of Jacksonville Station. I want to point out, though, that um, the construction of Jacksonville Station, the construction costs itself were at, um, I think, close to $11 million. But it's been funded 100% by either the federal government or the state. There has been no city local money put on the construction of this project. We were able to use the land value as our local match. So this is a great investment for the city of Jacksonville. Now, I know I probably haven't talked about a lot of the projects that maybe that you might be interested in, so I'd be happy to answer more questions. But we also have our website, which is jumpo-nc.org. Um, we have all the projects that we're currently working on available there. It has a lot more information, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I have just one. Yes. 
Will it be open 24-7? Great question, and no. <laughs> so right now we're planning on the building being open from 7 in the morning to 6 p.m., um, and that's subject to change. If Greyhound or Amtrak changes their schedule, then we might change ours to accommodate them as, as you know, okay. being um, good partners. But as of right now, it's just 7 in the morning to 6 p.m. Just 7 to 6? Yes, ma'am. So better than that. Area. Is that um, going to be done by the USO or by the city? Um, well, we're not quite sure. We had um, we engaged with the USO mm, about halfway through the design process with the hope that they might take that on. Um, but as of right now, um, I think they're kind of stretched with their, within their limits because of everything that's going on with their current home. So I think the intent is, is that the city is going to stand that up, and I think we're going to reach out to some veteran organizations to see if maybe they would like to partner um, we don't think it's going to be that much of a heavy lift, as we like to say, because we envision that there's only two deliveries of the Marines per day. So we don't know yet, but okay. that's kind of our plan. Okay. okay. If there are no further questions, thank you very much. I have one more. Oh, yes. Okay. Will it be uh, disabled accessory, accessible? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Oh, yes. All, all buildings that we have are required they have to, to be, be but mm -hmm. I'm just asking if you have one because I have a bunch of neighbors that have he's totally disabled. Yes. Nope. The entire the, the building is um, is ADA accessible. Um, so yes, great question. And thank you because there were uh, they were changing over at the barber shop when they come in from the bus station. Uh -huh. They would go to the barber shop. That's the guy in there. Could they change into their uniform? Yes. And they were letting them change to go to the base. So thanks again. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> All right. Now we have an update from the planning board. Yeah, from the planning board. In September, uh, we actually dealt with three different uh, unified <laughs> development ordinance text amendments, uh, basic housekeeping in some regards. Had to deal with hardships and uh, buffer yardage for uh, multi family zoning districts, another one with commercial use standards for self-service storage, and the last one was basically a pen change as to where senior centers could be in fact located. Now an example of their uh, uh, activity in the month of September, they are reviewing a 52 lot single family re uh, residential subdivision, and then another 36 single family lots and uh, not given locations on that but there is a push to get additional housing within the city of jacksonville they also issued 328 permits and had 797 field inspections just in september now october uh, this one is going to probably touch on community development later on the first one was just a pen change on hardships and buffers to zoning districts. The other was to actually amend the city of Jacksonville map in an area at the south corner of Gateway Drive South to high density residential multifamily units, which as we look forward could give good opportunity for a public-private partnership, and I'm sure Mr. King has probably addressed that. And that's what I have from planning. Thank you. Any questions or comments for planning? Okay. Now we'll have our community development. Good evening, everyone, again. With CDBG planning, we're going to cover our CDBG funding with the CARES Act, give you an update on the annual action plan and the planning process, and try to give you some town center updates that we've had um, in the past. Concerning the CDBG funding, the CARES Act, we have processed 548 applications. 214 households have been funded for a total of 100 thousand eight hundred and sixty eight um, amount in funds that have been spent what that means is we have a utility assistance program here with the city of Jacksonville 
so we can assist those folks who reside in the city of Jacksonville, have water counts with the city of Jacksonville. And if it's, if they, if their need is associated with the coronavirus, then we can assist paying some of those water bill accounts. Pot. Say again. Total pot available. The total pot available. We had like 530. Why do I have less than 50% applications been funded? Say, I'm sorry. Why well, have less than 50% of the applications been funded? Oh, because they have to be hit, um, income qualified. So, if they are income qualified and the, the, the assistance is associated with COVID, and you know, their situation is due to COVID, then they can't qualify for our funding. So we have several um, households that um, have applied that they're not residing in the city limits. So we still have to process those applications and, you know, identify those who are qualified. And I was just going to add to it that some of the applications are duplicates as well. Um, once they, because we started the program back in March 2020, it's a six month program that we can cover for the six months and some people have reapplied that we still have to process those applications as well. So the number 548 includes total applications that have been submitted through the website. Um, it also takes into account if anyone is over income because we do have to make sure that they are low to moderate income so their income is verified. And also we run into a case where documentation is not turned in. So because we're still waiting for documentation, that's where your number of 214 is truly funded. Those are the people that have actually gone through, turned in necessary, necessary documentation as well. So if anyone is knows anyone that has not applied, please do so because we still have funds available. Uh, we have updated the application so that way it is right there as soon as you do the application, what documentation is needed, which is your last pay stub. If you're currently getting unemployment or have received unemployment, we need that documentation. If there's a child support order or if there's any social security award letters, all of those documentations are required for those that are in the household. And we want you to be able to have all those documentations up front as soon as you submit your application so there's not a delay in us processing the application. Is this the only possible use of those funds? For no. What are, what are the uses are available? So uh, that's just one, one program that we developed for those funds. We had a total of $530,000. The other use of funds, we allocated $80,000 to East Carolina Human Service Agency for a rental assistance program. So those folks who rents are affected by COVID, they are behind about three months consecutive. Rent payments can be made on their behalf because of due to COVID. So they need to contact- Low to moderate income too? They are low to moderate income as well. So they need to contact um, East Carolina Human Service Agency, and they still have some funds over there to help with rental assistance. Is the city promoting that program at all? We, well, when they call the city, we, we send them over there. We refer them over there. They just have a, a certain pot of money, and they're coming to the end of that. So um, it may be some more funds, hopefully, that can come, you know, to us so that we can, be, we'll be able to help them. But we also have allocated for the prevention of uh, coronavirus and spread of that with the homeless shelter. So they needed a kitchen um, to be finished. We also awarded them regular CDBG money to have that kitchen renovation completed. So they are currently cooking out of the old facility on Court Street, and now they need to be able to finish. And we anticipate that they're finishing around the end of November the the kitchen expansion so that they can still serve those clients that's in the homeless shelter was uh oslo county given a pot of money for the same purposes for residents in the county so 
as far as I know, the affordable, the American Rescue Plan, mm -hmm. that money is different from the entitled money that we receive for the coronavirus. So they have, the county did receive some American Rescue Plan money that they are uh, allocating, um, I think it was like $30 million, and they allocated $5 million of that for affordable housing. So they are going through an RFP process. The applications were due, I think, around October the 14th, so they're probably going through those applications and then making recommendation to the county commissioners for um, to award that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, this is a question. Um, and this probably be, you know, a good question or a bad question. When do those funds run out? When do, do they have an expiration date? So we have up until we have six years to spend that money. Okay. So that money is not like our regular allocation that you have to spend every year. So they do understand that this was an urgent situation it was a national disaster so they gave us six years to spend that money and i will say that jacksonville has been progressive in spending those, those coronavirus dollars yes, uh, when i talked with um, the statehood agencies they said that that was a great way to utilize that money um, because most mis municipalities they have not utilized that money they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do with that money and our, our um, citizens have the luxury of being able to access those dollars quickly. Now, are we two years into that? Six We're years? two years into that. Okay. And Just like wanted I said, to make we sure. only received $530,000. So the two conditions are they be affected by COVID and it be for low and moderate income? Yes. It and you can to, develop another program if possible? It has to be low to moderate income. When you say low to moderate income, does that get stipulated by the people giving you the money? Yes, HUD is our funder, and we have to have we have three national objectives, which is to answer an urgent need such as hurricane or a national disaster, or to eliminate slum and blight, or to assist low to moderate income persons in our community. And the, 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 the line of the moderate income is where more, I'm more interested in because um, we're living right now in a, in a time where prices are increasing around us and our wages are not. Um, so if we are looking and cutting people off from this help due to some kind of a wage bar, being determined by previous prices well actually the 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 income is determined by the census so we just we recently had okay. a census and the census data will determine as yeah. far as in a formula how much money we're going to be getting and how much wage and how much lower poverty that we have here in this community so the medium income. Okay. So we get that information from the census from them. data. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So have they decided the amount for medium income? It's come out. It comes That's out right. every That's year right. annually. Right. So we have not received it from 21. We just have the same one that we used in 22. So when that comes out, it usually comes out in April, April mm -hmm. May around that time and then it will change or they would tell us it is it is not changing so it has not changed this year gotcha being it because we have a lot of people that live in the jacksonville that work on base that may or may not starting january get raised up to 15 dollars an hour mm -hmm. and that may be great mm -hmm. but what it may do is it may cut them off from the possibility of receiving help so you're still in a boat that you need help in but you just got a little bit of a raise in your job, but now you can't, you don't, you don't qualify for something that you probably should have and could have qualified before. Well, one of the things that we want to try to do is lift everyone out of this poverty situation that they're yeah. in. 
And economic mobility is a term that HUD is uh, using right now because of the situations as far as income and keeping people in housing and other services because it's more attractive to stay in those types of situations versus raising themselves out of poverty. So economic mobility is more than just um, having the services now agencies should be looking at what are you doing to help these people lift themselves out of the, the, the cycle of poverty. So we're going to be talking about that. Thank you. Wanted to all let you all know that the annual action plan, we have begun the planning process for that. Of course, you all know that we anticipate receiving about $600,000 in our CDBG, regular CDBG entitlement in our funds. So we are um, starting that process and that's going to include having our community input meetings. We're having our first one at Trent River Oakey Grove Missionary Baptist Association on November the 18th. And we're gonna have another one January 20th of next year. And we also invite all of our members of NESAC to come out and help us to conduct our community input meeting. NISAC, you all are supposed to be the one who um, is engaging into the community, so we welcome you all to come out. We had a very good showing in this community input meeting that we had um, at Clyde Irwin. So I wanted to give you, since we touched on Town Center, I wanted to give you um, an update. We have- Before you do that, uh, ma'am, I would just like to um, say this because a lot of times when it comes to community input, um, our community want to input after the fact. Um, so they can roll back one time so we all can see the dates in here and also the um, viewing audience can see the dates there also because if you want to have input into um, making our community better, um, make sure that Jacksonville is a caring community, and we are one city, my city, our city, we have to attend these um, with viable information that can help everyone, not just individuals. Are there any other opportunities for input, like via comment, email? Yes, we put, whenever we advertise, we will put in a survey and we will put send email out. You can send email to us. We will advertise it on our government channel. Uh, we have put it on the transportation buses. We've used the, Q, the QR codes to take you straight to the survey. We've used everything that we can use to um, try to get input. And I will say that in the previous, we have sometimes received about 20 responses you know, to the whole action plan. But last year we received over 150 responses. So it is, you know, just using um, social media and anything that's affordable to, afforded to us, we have been using it and we have had some, some input. So um, wanted to go take you off as, as far as um, the town center input, I mean the town center um, update wanted to give you some information that I've shared with the um, city manager's office and I know that um, the city council have also received this information and I think I've, already, I've sent some information to you all already, um, but wanna just update you on the current um, situation at town center. So Onslow Community Outreach, they has acted as a clearinghouse or as a, um, a central agency for folks to go and try to get access to some resources. And resources could include funding, some tips on where there's some housing. Um, they have um, contacted other um, um, housing providers. They have um, also connect, um, connected with some private landlords. So Onslow Community Outreach, they have acted as a housing support system um, center for us. And total, they have screened about 124 households. They have processed and housed about 20 um, households with a total of 39 people. 
They have spent over $20,000 of city funds and we have uh, processed an additional 20,000 moving forward. They have six pending households, which are 12 people and pending households have identified houses. They're just waiting on the documents so that they can complete that process. They have housed three households or eight people through the Onslow Strong Disaster Recovery Funds. Those are for folks who are not moving into the city limits. They're moving outside the city limits into the county. So Onslow Strong Disaster Recovery, they have um, put up $20,000 for those folks. River of Life Church has also volunteered to assist people who need moving assistance. So they have requested two households with some moving assistance. And that's just the, the caring community that we have right, you know, right now in front of us. Uh, if, if anything, if you have another church that will, would love to volunteer and help move some of these elderly people out of town center, you know, just let town center know and they will be glad to put you on the list. I also wanted to let you know that Sandy Run Apartments, they gave me a call and they, they had um, a report as well. Six people have been housed at Sandy Run Apartments. 14 were denied because of their criminal backgrounds, housing debts, or any poor landlord references. 25 were removed for not providing documentation, identification. Uh, they didn't qualify for HUD funding um, because of their over income. They didn't show up for their appointments and et cetera. This is what I was saying as far as lifting people out. As far as Neighborhood Improvement Services, partner with Onslow Community Outreach, we have to do a better job in getting information out to try to implement economic mobility. So what we need to do as a group is to find out how we can help get those people out of the cycle of poverty because right now those folks who have those type of negative things on their record it doesn't matter if we build 500 new housing units they're not going to qualify to go into those units so we're going to have to develop programs so that we can help those folks have an ex go through an expungement program to have some of those criminal uh, activities expunged off their records so that they can qualify for better housing. Uh, we can, we need to take our show on the road as far as our money management seminar to help them with their credit and teach them how to manage their money better. And also just plant the seed of home ownership <clears throat> so that they'll know that there are resources out there and there's opportunities if they do what they need to do that there's opportunity for them to even own their own home. We've done it in the past here at Community Development and there's opportunity to do so again. So as a, as a um, committee, you know, we have to come up with those types of solutions for our neighborhood. Okay? Yes, ma'am. We got a few things that... I, I think right now it would be, I was waiting for the moment to like, strike this iron while it's hot, especially of this particular um, advisory board. Uh, and I want you to think about something um, that Ms. Tracy said. So we're to advise and assist the city on matters of improving neighborhoods, inclu including connecting Jacksonville, diverse communities and neighborhood with their government, with their city government to facilitate effective public participation. And that's just part of what this board does so not only come in here and you know um come up with good ideas and have people come brief us but do exa exactly what um uh, miss tracy was talking about the um, economic mobility i think it came you know when we first got into it y'all been doing it a long time but when it coined that name was about four or five years ago and um, people didn't believe in that process you know of building up and i can tell you personally um, they've been on the road teaching whether it's the financial classes, um, the home ownership, um, because information and then execution 
So it's not only information, it's the information and execution is what's going to help our community get to a better place. And that's going to take all of us in here and everybody that's watching. So it's not only the information, the learning piece, but it's also the execution. We have to help one another execute the plan that we come up with. So I just wanted to put that out. That's what this board here, um, this committee is for. So I, I was waiting on the time, so I thought that would be a good time. Yes, sir. Right. Um, it is, it is um, with town center, the situation has arisen to where we can be an effective board so that we can make a difference to those folks that need to have a difference made in their lives. So I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you all and meeting with you all and having some new ideas, um, having um, your input, um, especially with this, commun this new community development um, action plan. Town Center is going to be mentioned a lot in this annual action plan. And, and th because I will tell you that HUD contacted me, the state contacted me and wanted to know because they heard about the situation that went on in town center. What are we doing and what are the local housing providers doing? And we have a short term, um, a short term solution, but we also have to have long term solution. I want you to know that I was directly involved with that, and if you do have any questions, I can give you an insight. Because I went around for three weeks in town and looked for apartments in very many areas. And a lot of them were just simply out of my budget. And the reason that I asked before about how much somebody can earn before they get turned down is because in my search, I found an apartment for, it, had, it was a three bedroom apartment in the commons. Everything that I wanted, all my check marks was perfect. Perfect price range, perfect place, good for my daughter's school, good for our future. But then I found that it was a HUD, you know, uh, funded zone, meaning that I had to make under a certain amount because if I made more than that, I wouldn't be allowed to move there. When they did the math, I went $40 over, 40. And I just got a 75 cent raise at work. So hmm. knowing that you went over for one week's worth of whatever you just got in bonus hurt. And then we had to keep looking and thank God we were able to find a place. Before I went to go look, I was told by a lot of people that people in Jacksonville understand and know what's going on with Town Center and they're willing to help. That first part is true. I'm not so sure about that second part. Reason being is because I went around. Nobody waived an application fee, as I was told that they were going to do. I wasn't able to live in Sandy Run because I made too much money. So there are a lot of factors holding back good people that are, have money, are willing to work. You know, a, a good example of my um, success out here and what I've seen in others in Jacksonville, in this city, you have a lot of great people and a lot of great heart. But if you have a man running in place and you hold him up, if you don't give him a foundation to run on, he's just running in place. And you have a lot of people that want to do better and do good. And they're working and, and they're running but they have nothing underneath their feet. So it's just air. If you can give them an opportunity to find a job and work and work yourself out of that hole, not just hope yourself out of that hole, because that's what I did and that's what works. Yes, there may be other ways, but that's what I did and that's what worked for me and I've seen it work for others. I've seen others come and I trained them and three years later they were buying houses here in Jacksonville, mm -hmm. planting roots making houses, you know? So I know about four or five families like that. Be, being because, why? Because when I moved from Puerto Rico, I had to leave my whole, all my family behind, you know? And I had to make new friends out here and be very careful of who I let into my life, you know? 
this is a new life and you don't want to you don't want to associate with the with the wrong crowd mm -hmm. but i let people that had my same mindset that were set on being dedicated fathers and family man and uh there's about like five of them you know i have five good friends in my eight years that i've been here they're families now and i consider them my family but that's how i saw them get out of that hole mm -hmm. i saw them work hard but they all they had was that opportunity. A lot of people ask me, why did you move to Jacksonville? Because they don't, <laughs> they don't understand why here. I have a brother in the Marine Corps, and that's one of the reasons I moved to Jacksonville, but one of the main reasons was opportunity. Because y'all still have this small town charm, believe it or not. Y'all, if y'all have if been living here all your life, yeah, exactly. We have that small town, town charm still. So we got to take advantage of that so that we can use it to grow, give people opportunities to work. Because if you give people an opportunity to make their own money and feel proud and be able to spend it, you're going to have a better community. You're going to have a, a happier dad when he comes home, a happier mom when she comes home, and a happier kid when he comes home from school. And that, you know, one smile in the morning and it affects everybody, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I lived off of hope for a long time and I still have hope, but without work and sweat, it's nothing, it's lost. So, I, but I know a lot of people that want to put in work, but they just have nowhere to run. So that's something to think about too and any questions that y'all may have about town center. Luckily, I was able to find a place and I will be moving in a week. So I'm into that. So, you know, the, the long term to that is also creating affordable housing. Yeah. Affordable housing has to be intentional and commit, committed. So we have some developers that are committed into building some affordable housing in this area. I do know that they have, like I said, they have some RFPs that came in through the county. Um, the, our own city has offered up some land over there in the commons to try to get some senior affordable housing built over there. Um, but it takes some time. It takes some time. Oh, yeah. And with this, with this situation that has come to the head of whatever underlying, all, it, all the, storm, the um, hurricane um, Florence did, is tear off the need for affordable housing because it took a lot of affordable housing offline. And then we had the coronavirus pandemic. So that was another layer that has come off to reveal mm -hmm. the need of affordable housing. So it's going to take some time, um, but folks like you who were just above that, that income limit, because they are, we, we, we are, bound by that that amount so mm -hmm. you know for those folks that are a little bit above they have another tier that you still can qualify that is still is going to be affordable so those developers are you know they're they're prominent here in jacksonville and i will say we do have some long-term solutions coming mm -hmm. thank okay. you let me yes, jump in here right quick um i did have a conversation with one of the property managers out at town center Make sure if you could have a conversation with anybody that lives out there, make sure they that the property manager is aware that they're leaving the out of town center. Because there are a lot of people, a lot of families just leaving out and not, you know, if they have a lease still active, it can still go against them. So they still, despite the conditions of town center, mm -hmm. it's still important that they communicate with the uh, property manager there, so it won't cause any problems to their down the road. That's right. That is exactly right, because yeah. everyone signed a lease or they have a verbal yeah. lease, they have something, an agreement. And when you have an agreement, you agree Still to pay, you agree to stay there, and you agree to pay. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you leave no with them knowing that you have the intent to leave. You have to give them notice. Yeah. Because there's, there's been a lot of confusion about that, and it, it's, it's been said that you don't have to pay, uh, you know, that's not true. 
That's if not true. If you're in an apartment, you have to pay. You have to you know, abide by the agreement. Lease. You know, the only thing is, you know, still, you're still under the contract of that property manager. That is correct. So that's important. Also, I heard it's about 211 units that still have families in it right now. I think, think 15 of the 67, that was most of Eastwood, uh, they're out. And the other 40, um, I guess, between December mm -hmm. and, and June, June okay. they'll be out. They are moving some families around to some of the, yeah, the safer I, ones. I saw a family yeah. next to my house get moved forward across right. the street. Right. And this passing week, I saw about four U-Haul trucks pulling back up into different apartments. Okay. And, so, so it's happening, you know, it's, it's happening. moving. There's a lot of people moving. Yeah. And yeah, I called the office and she, uh, they had told the property manager had told me that a lot of people were saying they were going to move and then not moving. Yeah. So that was also causing confusion and messing up certain plans because I'm pretty sure it's a spaghetti of well, information say, out there. I will say if anyone has received assistance through the city funding, they need to move out of those units. Yeah. If they, have one of them. if they have received any city of assistance, they have to move out of those units. I was wondering, you know, do, do we deal with the HOPE program here? Yes, because... Is that HOPE for NC? Yes. That is a program to where, because of the pandemic, funds became available to the state. And the state agreed to pay to prevent homelessness, to pay some of these rents. And I want to say it's in increments of three months. Correct. So every three months, you have to qualify for more and more and more. Yes. Um, but those folks who are going through those, that program, which also is a unit of federal funds, they need to contact Hope for North Carolina and see whether or not they can transfer that assistance to their new unit. That's what I was wondering, because um, at the moment, I have three months and I'm, I say I, but there's a lot of people that are in this situation where they got approved for the whole program, they got approved for Onslow Community Outreach, but if uh, they got approved for three months of the whole program and they're going to move off to the first month and they're going to have to go to Onslow Community Outreach help, well, what happens to those last two months of the HOPE funds? That's what they, they keep getting the funds. They need to contact NC Hope and let them know the situation as far as the conditions of the housing, and that's why they're moving out. Um, because Onslow Community Outreach, their funds, remember, it's only for one month and the rent and utility deposit. Yeah. If you still need help paying your rent, you need to contact the HOPE program and see whether or not they can transfer your assistance to another unit. Do you know if that's possible or no? You, I have no idea. Yeah, I would have to I, find out. Yeah, you would have to ask those types of questions. Yeah, because that way I can also inform of everybody in the, mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of what's going on, and that way help that way, you know? Yeah. I'm more known in the neighborhood, so I can go ahead and just let people know, hey, look, do this, do that, and call these people. Because I've been trying to put some weight on my shoulders for them and help carry, you know, some of their responsibilities mean having more access to internet and those kind of capabilities. Um, so, yeah, because it was, it, I only ask because it's been difficult for me to contact Hope. I tried for an entire week to contact Hope. I haven't been able to contact nobody. Yeah. I think we had um, like a resource page um, at our last meeting, had a lot of different research, resources. Um, that we can send out. If we can send out that email to We can group, resend that email out to everyone. Any new ones that we may have so we can make sure that the information is out there. Um, thank you. But yeah. thank you. I, I really do appreciate the update. And um, Councilman Jackson, this may be for you to take back to the city council, whoever. My question is, as these uh, people are moving out, right, how long um, will town center right? That's what it's called, town center. Sit there um, unattended before we start seeing windows missing, doors gone, before it becomes a big eyesore. Well, um, so you can just take that back. That's, yeah. You don't have I'm, to answer I'm, it. I'm going to just say that. And that's in any community that you have that. That's why I put it out there. You know, it's, it's, it is going to be an issue going forward. Yeah. It is. Um, yeah. And that, that falls back on our police department. Yeah. And, and I'm just saying know. that we could take that back for, yeah. you know, to jump on it quicker because um, 
Well, I'll talk to you. Uh, about what I'm and thinking. We, okay. Yeah, it's going to be a community effort. Okay. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. And, and follow my police. And remember, some of my um, community development block grant funds can eliminate slum and blight. <laughs> we have torn down some units over there at Town Already? Center. That's right. Anything that was just that they gave us permission to tear down, we we went over there and we tore it down. So okay. uh, we only have a, a a small budget, but we'll tear down as much as we can with it. A lot of that is going to go back to what the owner does mm -hmm. and how fast he decides to do it. That's exactly you right. Know? We have to have permission from the owner. No, no, not not necessarily city. I'm saying, but if we went in and told the owner, hey, they got to go because it's unsafe. Now we're creating another unsafe by empty buildings just being there in that area. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because I've seen it happen because there's a sec there's sections that are very downtrodden, to put it that way, right? And I since we have also a community outreach right next to town center, okay. if if they're not in there. They look for shelter within the homes of town exactly. center. Yeah. And, and as a kid, I'm from Houston. I grew up in, in, in Houston. We call that a playground. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. exactly. I, I've so made kids go <laughs> aid decisions on other housing yeah. in the community. So I'm just throwing that I'm out. I'm just like, you know, I made decisions yeah. on other housing in the community out in Georgetown area. And because I saw kids in the area, I had um, old homes, old buildings torn down. I said we couldn't go any further. You know, okay. many code violations, yeah. stuff of that nature. So, it's we're gonna have to push back, you know, on to the owners, mm -hmm. and it's and, gonna and it's assess other thought, codes you know. and, you know, stuff of that nature. But it's uh, and, and the reason why I brought it up is because you know we're sitting, we're talking about everybody moving out, and that's a good thing. But now we have some another issue that just happened because everyone moved out, and we don't want to add one issue on top of another right. on top of another. So that was just something just to kind of put out. I don't know where you know where it's from you may you know ask the um time point do they plan on fencing it off well or something i don't know i was yeah, just bringing that up i can't even you know i know they're trying to consolidate as much as they can mm -hmm. um i know there's issues with even getting contractors to fit anything in jacksville period okay um but and then we already had 400 something about 400 some units already vacant That's i'm correct. Sure, sure there's been issues over there already so it, it it's it's going to be an issue. It's going to be yeah. an issue. We just okay. got to figure out the best way to handle it. All right. I think we got some work done on that one. We got work to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we'll touch the um, neighborhood initiatives. I have one question for you, Mr. Okay, go ahead. This 40K that the city has invested, where did it come from? Was it CDBG funds? You said, I'm sorry, baby. The 40K that the city has invested, where did it come from? That came from the CARES Act money. Thank you. And now we're going to have Pam give an update. So that was a that was a great segue, um, Chairperson Smith, leading into demolitions. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Pamela Trafton, coordinator, and we are coming up on demolitions. We are actually preparing for our 150th demolition celebration. Um, it is November 15th at 9 a.m. We have units 104, 106, and 110 Miracle Drive that we will be demolishing at that time. Um, this is actually um, at the corner of Bell Fork and Marine Boulevard next to the fish market. There's three houses that are right there beside it that we are going to be taking down. And it falls in conjunction with the new Transportation Modal Center that is going to be open. So as the main thoroughfare is opening up, we'll have that as a clear slate as well. Uh, we also have um, Court Street will be opened up with another demolition, the old Second Chance Mission um, Church that's on the hill. That one will be torn down starting next week. Um, so that one will be prepared for more housing units available. The city owns that? Yes, yes. ma'am. We will, will we be developing on that air, land? Like we will be, like the city will be contracting contractors for development on that land? It would be available for a homeowner to purchase and build their lot there, build ah. their home there. Okay. Yeah. the whole program, so he, he you know. Yeah. So I have that one coming up. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, but 
invite all NESAC members to come out for the celebration as well. Um, we have the unfortunate circumstances that we've lost a employee that was a vital part of our process. Um, Pernell Rios, he um, passed unfortunately, and we want to take a moment to recognize him during that time as well, as he's been vital in our demolitions. Yes, ma'am. One with the one ten Miracle Drive. You said by the old fish market, Leonard's Square. Fish Market, on the corner of Bell Fork and um, Marine Boulevard, right there at that corner. Oh, the, the, the little bitty one up by where it mm -hmm. crosses over instead of down by the other fish market. Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. All those houses down that little road. Three of them. Three of them. Just three of them. Okay, because I'm wondering yeah. where all these houses are by the fish market. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah, not all of them. Just three of them. <laughs> the old Leonard's fish market. The old Leonard's fish market. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm trying to be there. Um, also, we are coming up for our Jacksonville Youth Council. We still are meeting the first Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. Um, due to meeting location this school year, we have moved to Kerr Street Recreation um, just to have a permanent spot so that way you don't have to say this month we're meeting here, this month we're meeting here. We're going to meet consistently at Kerr Street Recreation. It is open to high school students in Oslo County, Camp Lejeune, 9th through 12th grade. It's a great opportunity for them to come in, let us know what are the concerns that Youth Council um, can help address. Also look at life skill opportunities with guest speakers to come and speak before the youth as well. i just like to say when you can move it back to City Hall, it would be nice because it's nothing like those kids sitting at this dais having that opportunity. Sure. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, nonprofits. So if you are part of a nonprofit, we have our last executive roundtable this year scheduled for November 17th. We are going to be in person at Coastal Carolina Community College. The topic is going to be the budget telling, how to tell your story with guest speaker Natasha Davis, who is the CEO of WPS Strategy Group. She was the former executive director of Keno at UNC Wilmington. So if you are part of a nonprofit or would like to come out and find out exactly what can your budget tell you, please register. The website is jacksonvillenc.gov backslash nonprofit. Lunch will be provided. Please register. Your executive directors and your board chairs. Yes, ma'am. We should open. I tried to register last night, but I couldn't maneuver on. I think I was from something I was doing wrong. It is open. Um, UNC Wilmington has updated their website. Okay. So call me tomorrow if you have issues, and I can walk you through it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we are also proud to announce that registration is open for our board development conference. We are ahead of schedule for Thursday and Friday, February 3rd and 4th of 2022. I think I added too many 20s. Yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, registration is available as well as JacksonvilleNC.gov nonprofit. Okay. Due to the conference being one of our larger events, we have decided to make this another virtual event um, just to kind of still be in front of COVID. So this will be open to anybody that's part of the nonprofits, thinking about doing a nonprofit, interested in joining a nonprofit. We want you to be able to come out. Um, so that is February 3rd and 4th, 2022. All right. In preparation for our neighbor initiative, neighborhood initiatives, I am pleased and ecstatic to say that our classes are really filling up. Um, our next class is November 20th from 8 to 5. This class has been full since August. Yeah, it has been full since August. And we are already taking registrations for our January class. So if you have anyone that has the inkling of being a homeowner, have them call us at 910-938-5286 to get 
into the class. The class is $25 per person from 8 to 5 p.m. And we will have different uh, representatives that will come forth and talk about what it means to go through the home buying process from a financial coach, lender, realtor, home inspector, financial coach, foreclosure prevention specialist, and home maintenance. It is a full day, um, but it does not feel like it's a full day. I feed you, continental breakfast, and lunch is provided by our sponsor, but it is a wealth of information. It does not mean that you're going to walk away being 100% knowledgeable in the process. It means that you're going to be 100% more knowledgeable than what you walked in the door with to get started on the process. <coughs> so please contact us at 938-5286 to get into the class for January 20th. 2022. Money management by popular demand. So we had a class this past weekend, and that was supposed to be our last class. However, due to the amount of participation, due to us filling the classes as fast as we have been filling them, we are hosting a special class on December 4th from 9 to 12. It is the first Saturday. It will take place at the Center for Public Safety. That is another class that I can fit up to 25 persons. And it was identified even more due to the town center and hearing a lot of the reasons why people are not being able to move into the housing and realizing that education of money management and financial education is key. We wanted to go ahead and have a class this year instead of saying our next class was in February. So anyone that has the necessary needs on how to manage their finances, how to work with budget, how to work with what does your credit mean, what is on your credit report. And the best thing about our instructor, Rachel Gerald, is she meets you where you're at. So it's not a matter of I need all this money to be able to take care of what I have. Let's look at what you have now, manage that, and then the rest is going to continue to come. Show you where the money is that you didn't even know was there. I so highly, highly recommend, well, you know, Pam, I can't recommend this too strongly. The speaker is outstanding. First time I met her was years ago down at Kerr Street Rec Center when she did a program that was sponsored by, I think First Citizens Bank did that first one. Mm -hmm. And it was a two-day one. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's excellent. She is, she presents very clean, very clear. Uh, and people shy away from those things because, like you said, if I don't have any money, what do I have to manage? If you're breathing and eating anything, you've got money, even if it's $3.21 for that McDonald's uh, 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 Happy Meal you just bought. And the, what, how she weaves this through your, your actual life. And one of the first things I picked up on when I first heard her talk was, you know how you go through the line at uh, Walmart or any grocery store? And before you check out, they always ask you, do you want any cash back? Now, all of, many of us, including myself, you're getting ready to go out of town or go somewhere. You forgot to go to the bank. It's closed. You know, all of this kind of stuff is going on. So you just hit that thing and say, yeah, I just want $20. I just need a couple of dollars in my pocket, so I take $20. You will take $20 on that cash back, and you will pay back $25 because the interest rate on your debit or your credit card for cash back is the highest rate you can get, 24.99, 25%. So for every $20 you get when you push that cash back button, you will pay back 25. That's a huge amount. They arrest people for charging less money on the street than that. But this is how banks operate. And what I'm saying is that when you think about what you think you don't have and what you think you, well, they're not talking to me, it's, Sheep just pointed out, there are little things like that that keep you from going to the next level, you know. And the smallest things, and I have never done it since, I want you to know, and that was I don't know how many years ago when she said that, and I have not to this day done it again. Because it's just take care of your business. And that's what she emphasizes. Be, start where you are, but handle your business. You know, you're grown, you've got kids who are looking up to you. Whatever you think you don't have, 
you will have more if you follow her, her pattern and, and just the encouragement she gives. And she really encourages you by saying that you can do this. You're not sitting here talking to somebody who's from uh, Schwab about do you have $100,000 to invest. She's talking about a one, and she has her own story. That's what she talked about when I saw her at Kerr Street, that she was a woman who was doing the same thing most of us are doing and got trapped. And she worked her way out of it. So you knew that when she talked to you, it wasn't something she hadn't already lived herself. So anybody who's thinking about this, I more than highly recommend it. Uh, like she said, there's steps for everything. There's, a, there's a, a process. Trust the process, as they say. Right. And don't think that you can leap from that Saturday to Monday morning. I can walk into one of these banks around here and get paper written for my mortgage. Because, mm -hmm. But don't get frustrated by that. Just, it just takes the process. process. And if you listen and learn the process with her, she walks you through. She is, it's just outstanding. So I would strongly recommend, and even yeah. as you're talking to people, this young man right here, people that you know that are really, they're having a hard time at Town Center trying to mm -hmm. juggle I'm, all of this stuff. I'm trying to get a bunch of my friends, encourage them to actually invest money. Now that we have more accessibility to platforms where we mm -hmm. can use to actually invest in the actual stock market, I did it myself. I saw the fruits. And I started talking to my friends and saying, hey, even if it's $200, if you can set it aside and we can start investing, throw it into a good company, mm -hmm. I'll give you the, the basics and you take it from there. But mm -hmm. I believe that in long-term investment comes long-term gains, you know? So mm -hmm. th that's another way that we have to start thinking about things Absolutely. and so, teaching you know, people I how really to- I really do recommend her class. I was gonna say, yeah, I don't know if I told y'all, but the class itself is free. That's what I was going to ask. There you go. <laughs> so it's a priceless investment in getting yourself ready. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is there any literature that um, is accessible to the public to receive, the, uh, to, to understand that these things are available? Or is there something that can be given to me where I can give those things That's out? That's going to be on that resource. Okay. Uh, that'll and, be on um, that resource. And because this is a class that we just scheduled, I'll have a flyer made for that that will be sent out to the committee. And we'll be having it posted as well on G10 and available for social media because we literally just scheduled this Saturday morning. And keep in mind, um, everyone in the room, everyone's watching. These are all the things that the city has um, made available, you know, because like she said, the class on Saturday was supposed to be the next class or the last class, and they scheduled another one. And then also know that there are, you know, churches and other nonprofit organizations in the area that is that's doing the same thing that's um, just trying to build this area up, you know, with knowledge. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, you're going to have to do a little bit of work to find it, you know, um, but sometimes that little bit of work will pay off in the long run. Um, so now, are you have anything else, ma'am? I just want to... Um, I guess make a, a, a plea to any general contractors that are interested in doing business with the city. I have projects, rehab projects, we have renovation projects here with the city, and I have put the projects out to bid several times, and I have no one to bid on that project. So I encourage any general, licensed general contractor to please contact me personally, Tracy Jackson, here at the city of Jacksonville. My number is 910-938-5286. Please contact me if you're interested in doing business here with the city. I have so many projects, but I have no contractors that are bidding on those projects. So please, let's help our community put some affordable housing back into the, um, into the stock. I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to go down to the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm going to pull the list, and I'm going to cold call them and just ask them what they want to do. That's, that's what I would do. That, that was a, that, we have, have done that suggestion. before, too. <laughs> I have one suggestion for uh, Tracy. Uh, I was just thinking of what you said, that you do put it out, everything. But if you would put out, print them out, leave some out at City Hall, I would personally come pick them up, put them in my church, put them in the lodge, and word of mouth goes a long way. So a lot of people don't do G10 and don't do the paper. 
And a lot of them don't get that the note that they send in, you know, what, the water bill or something like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of them don't get that either because they're kind of, but if you do, I will personally, like I did for scholarships, pick them up from City Hall, put them in our churches, all the churches that I know around, so they can be over at Oak Grove. Right, thank you. All right. Turn out to see what we can get. And at this time, it's the time for us to brag on our city a little bit, you know, tell what's good that's going on with our one city, our city, my city moment. And if anyone has any of those moments, um, you can please speak up at this time. We just got through doing today. As of today, we did uh, donations for homeless veterans. And it was at the church down at the end of, I don't know what the name of the church is, but it's right across from uh, KFC on Western Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And the lady at their church, the their Day church, Street. you know, she contacted me. So, and we bought T-shirts, everything that they would need to homeless, and even bought tops, which we really shouldn't have to. But... They took it up, and she came by and picked it up this morning. So that's just some supplies we have for the homeless veteran. Amen. Thank you. Thank you guys for that. Thank you guys for that. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is, um, and we I don't know if I mentioned it here, the Jacksonville, the CHU program, which helps feed our children on the weekends. Um, we normally don't have a problem during the week, but they feed um, families and children on the weekend. And I just wanted to spotlight the, the Jacksonville Chew program um, for our One City Moment um, because I actually got a chance to visit their facility and how much, you know, throughput and how many families they're supporting in our city on the weekend. Um, so, and that's, that's just amazing. So if you get a chance, just go uh, by their facility, um, check them out. And if you can, whatever organization you are with or personally, help donate to that also. Um, because if we can not only help the children while they're going to school, but also on the weekend, uh, we can help them be productive uh, with their grades and um, in our community. So I want to personally thank them uh, for their efforts. At United Way, because that is a United Way yes. program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, this one is, uh, if I'm right, is specifically designed to, you know, there are kids who are the on weekend. free and reduced lunch programs, but what happens to the gap of time, because some of the kids that we have, the only meals they get are the ones they get while they're in school. So when school is out on Fridays, they get a book bag. I don't book know whether bag. they yes, take right. it yes. and they fill it up with various uh, food items that are donated, okay. and it gets the family through the weekend okay. till the kids get back That's in nice. on it. Yeah. And they're feeding over 600 kids in our school system. Wow. Yes, so it's, this yeah. is a big and, issue. And it's amazing. So that's why I not only, you know, pointed out, but solicit, it, they, <laughs> they're constantly needing help. Mm -hmm. um, you can go there on a Monday, the place before, and on a Friday, it'd be empty. So they're putting that much food out, and it's not going to waste. So, mm -hmm. all right. All right, do we have anything before we get into the future agenda topics? I have what future agenda topics? Yes, sir. I had a suggestion. Um, we're at the end of the year, and we have another meeting. Our last meeting for the year is December mm -hmm. meeting. Uh, I just, and I've heard a lot of things today that... Uh, we that need talking about, but we uh, don't necessarily have the time to devote within a short period of time, you know, to do it. And I was going to suggest uh, to the group, if you are amenable to it, that we use the December meeting and anything that we can put off. I mean, I, the reports are great and we love to hear them, but they can re-rolled over because they're not going to stop you all from doing the work that you're planning on doing. I would like to make the suggestion that we do not do regular business on the December meeting. We use that time to devote to what we did tonight, to have some way of just discussing, because we had an excellent meeting this morning sponsored by HUD for our community action agency. And I told them then this morning that housing is a crisis in the United States. It's not just about what's going on around over there at New River. This is a US problem. Well, really it's worldwide, quite honestly. And all of us learned in school, food, clothing, and shelter is what human beings have to have in order to be human beings. 
and uh, too many people are going without one or the other or all of that. And so, uh, and the problem we have is that there's funding to be had to address all of these issues because, you know, you heard me say, there is enough money to do anything we want to do if we have the political will to do it. You know, when you're talking about how every time I hear that expression, there's not enough money, there's no money to do this, that is not true. Yes, there's always money to do what we decide we want to do. And so, but we need to be talking with each other. All these funding sources are in silos. HUD's money's in a silo. Your situation where you're $40 above a limit, that's been put there for well-thinking people who don't do this kind of work and don't get how that impacts the actual person that they're saying no to, mm -hmm. because they're making this decision in Washington yes. or in Raleigh. Right. And so I, my suggestion basically is that we forego a regular business meeting, mm -hmm. because, and one thing about the city, I feel that um, there are many departments within the city, and they all have very clearly defined issues, water and sewer, trash pickup, building, we just saw DOT and all of that kind of thing. Seems to me everything that is, re that is a remotely related to the people who live here falls in their laps. We've only got two women running here uh, to, front to, to run this program. When I started in 87, we had four staff members and we had a budget of around $750,000. We have gone to the point where we, I'm surprised we had that increase this time. We had gotten down to what three hundred and fifty thousand somewhere along in there, and with two people. Let me let me correct that, Miss Marsha. Mm -hmm. we, we're still expecting to get the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but we also have because of loans, we have program income. But so you have program the total income. budget. Yes, but uh, the things that affect people that they can see come out of this. Department. So you're, you know, you're just and proposing so I'm just suggesting that, our, that just forget about the minutes and the ado uh, adoption okay. of the agenda, all of that, and start having a real conversation about what could be happening because we've taken field trips to other cities and seen what they do with their CDBG grant. Yeah. And the lady who was in here with the uh, earlier and talked about DOT, you heard her say that they have millions of dollars that built that building over there. Mm -hmm and not a dime of it came out of jet because they have the opportunity to go after deep pockets. There are deep pockets out here to do the work that needs to be done. There's no way it can be done in a form like this. There's no way. But I feel like just at least bringing up the conversation, talking about it, what can we do to strengthen the commitment that the city of Jacksonville has to this department? Okay. Because quite honestly, I go on record saying I don't think it's sufficient. Okay. Um, the department or head or wh whatever her title was, you know, retired last year in July to, to relocate, and that position was not filled. So I'm saying that to say that we need, if, if I, I've been dealing with this organization since 1987, I mentioned it, I see it go through a number of evolutions. Mm -hmm. I've stayed on it this long because I feel committed to it. People don't care about the water until you turn on the faucet and nothing happens. They don't care about the sewer until you flush the toilet and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But the see, this program shows you what you can do to change neighborhoods, to change people's lives, and it deserves more support than it's getting. Not only financially, but in every way, at least in my opinion. I've been here long enough that I feel I can say that. So I would just like to have a conversation about uh, what's going to happen in 2022, where do we see ourselves going in a year, five years, ten years? What's going to happen here? This housing situation will never change until somebody jump starts a conversation about this situation in a global sense, a wide sense, not just about what's happening at town center, but what's happening to people who can't find appropriate housing anywhere, whoever they might be. Yes, right. And uh, so, and I know we can't achieve everything in one meeting, but I certainly think that we can start a conversation that we might be able to join with other groups. The one we had this morning, we're already talking about some kind of a symposium in the spring, because there was a lot of energy, positive energy that came out of just this one hour and a half meeting this morning about housing. And so uh, I think that once we start talking about this, we will attract people 
that have a concern and an interest in it and see what we can do about some of this, you know, and I think this is no time like the present in terms of politically and financially and any other way. So that would be my, my soapbox. Yes, sir. Uh, so to sum up what I just heard, in the month of December, uh, we won't do our regular meeting like this. What we will do is pretty much a planning meeting for um, 22 and possibly future directions is what I would call it. and get our future um, directions. Okay. Um, are you talking about bringing in uh, senior executive city staff here, as no. part? Okay. I'm talking about the group sitting right here. Okay. Our our group because we have to agree to either take this somewhere or we have to agree that this is not our dog to deal with, one of the two. But um, just a conversation like we've been having this evening, mm -hmm. except we don't spend the time doing uh, other, the other agenda stuff. items. Yes, and then if the plan we come up with involves other people, then that will happen or not happen as we see. We might decide just to keep on doing what we're doing and just let the rest of it go. But um, that's how I feel about, you know, uh, what we've been uh, okay. doing. All right. Now, I second everything Ms. Marsha said, and I, I would like to see um, support for this department strengthened and community development reestablished as it was. Just putting my thoughts out there. Okay. I, I, I'll get your number and kind of we'll talk offline about that, okay? Sure. All right. So let me ask Ms. Marsha. Yes. Yeah. I mean, talking about silos. NC360. Is that where all of these different organizations are supposed to come together, in a sense, or that NC360 is supposed to be the hub to connect uh, to these all these various I organizations? I think that the goal of NC360 is to provide a uh, some kind of a platform where need for uh, needs not correct me if I'm wrong needs and resources come together. They meet. Uh, if you enter the system because you can't find a home. You, when you come in, there's someone who assesses everything going on with you. And as a result, not only do you get referred for a home, but you get referred because you need insurance and don't have health insurance and don't have it. Because you need food and you don't have it. And 360 is designed, I think, to do that and shoot that referrals out to uh, participating resources so you hook up needs and resources in a smoother way. That is the overall intention, right. you know, of in, that in platform. In saying that, I was thinking maybe we should probably reach out to Jared concerning that, because he might have a better understanding of how to get through to these organizations, because he he is that center point. Right? Well, once again, that might be an eventuality, right. because it could be that we decide once again that this committee decides we're going to keep on doing what we've been right. doing and leave that to someone else. And I would be all right with that. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Marsha, Brian. Let us close this out, right? Then if we want to continue afterwards, because I do agree with what Ms. Marsha said about our December meeting. Uh, I get that, but I was just bringing that to the forefront uh, because if, if you do have a center point, I kind of was that center point when I was work, work for, um, I was liaison to National Guard Bureau. And I know if you have that center point, then that's the connecting point. Okay. So then it won't be no need to try to go after all these other folks because you have that center point that's already connected to the rest of those groups. And we could discuss that further, yeah. but that's why I was bringing that point forward. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And that was kind of for our next meeting so we can bring yeah. all of that information together yeah. and um, he might be we can really have, you meeting. know, a direction we can um, aim for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, when, you, when you've been sitting here for, I know, a good, it's over 30 years. Yes, and I've never left it because, I, and I certainly had opportunities to do so, but I uh, still feel very strongly about it. So, yes, you thought the future date? <laughs> All right. So most of these dates we've covered already. Uh, one that we have not discussed is November 20th, the holiday parade. So I look forward to seeing our NISAC advisory committee members joining us. 
that Saturday in the parade. And then we did not discuss December 15th and 16th is the beginning of our funding workshop. So for any nonprofits that are um, interested in submitting application for our community development block grant or our public private partnership funding, the workshop is December 15th and 16th. December 15th is at 10 a.m. And December 16th is at 2 p.m. You only have to attend one workshop. Um, they'll take place right here in council chambers. This will be an introduction into what our city funds have been used, our um, city funds and our community development block grant funds have been utilized for. Also identifies the annual action plan focus of what type of um, activities we are looking to fund in the upcoming year for fiscal year 23. So those dates are December 15th and 16th. And then Sandy Run is hosting a resource fair for their tenants as well. The Thank you. And then CDAC will have our own workshop based on the input for these grants, right? Yes, sir. PPP. Public private partnership. PPP, I think that's still 20,000. 20, 20, Our next meeting is remember our next meeting in December 20th. That's when we would do our um, meeting at Miss Marsha. So come in, relax with a lot of ideas um, so we can execute some things in uh, 2022. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for coming tonight. Thank everyone who's watching. And um, I would like to call this meeting adjourn. Adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Call this meeting adjourn.